Last week we talked about growing in grace. I told you it would be kind of a three-part um, little mini-series within the series here. Growing in grace, we talked about what that means, um, really what it does it mean as well. We talked about the importance of it in our lives and the biblical mandate to grow in grace. Of course, last week it was called the mandate to grow in grace, um, growing in grace part one. Tonight is growing in grace part two. We're going to discuss the marks of growing in grace. What are the things that will be practically a part of our lives and growing in our lives if we are in fact growing in grace? There are certain qualities, certain attributes of our lives that reveal to us and to others that we are growing in grace. J.C. Ryle says this, When you see these marks... You see a growing soul. Now you may notice the the term, it jumped out to me when I read that. When you see these marks. That's interesting. When you see these marks. That is because as J.I. Packer says, growing in grace is visible. That does not mean that it is always clear to see. There are times where these attributes will be clear for other people to see. The growth in these areas will be easily manifested to others. And there may be times where you've grown in these areas and it may not be as easy to see. But nevertheless, growing in grace is a visible thing. Now, as Brother James has said, often it is not our job to run around and make sure that everyone that that we can see these things as well as we should be able to see them like you know what i don't think i'm seeing this in your life like i need to be seeing it in your life maybe you're just not growing in grace um that is not our job our job is not to run around checking to make sure that we can see visibly what we think we need to be seeing at the time however i don't want us to fall to the other extreme And start thinking that growing in grace has nothing to do with being able to visibly see the difference. It does. Growing in grace is visible. So let's look at a few of these marks tonight. Um, I have one, two, three, four, five, six of them. It's not an exhaustive list. I'm not going to give you all the marks of growing in grace. All the things that I'm going to give you six uh, good ones. And I told you last week. Um, that a majority of these three sessions will be coming from J.C. Ryle's book, Holiness. Um, and so it is tonight. I've obviously tweaked a few things and changed a few things and reworded a few things for us. The first one, what, what, what is one of the predominant marks? Well, it's sensitivity to sin. Now, we already talked about repentance. We talked about repenting already. And, of course, that goes hand in hand with this first one here. Uh, which is sensitivity to, st- to sin. And we've already talked about humility. In order for us to be sensitive to sin, in order for us to be willing to repent, we have to be a humble people. You have to be a humble person. To admit to yourself, I have failed, I have erred. And to admit to God, I have failed, I have erred. And to admit to other people, I have failed, I have erred. Uh, last week, I, uh, I shared my testimony last week about my battle and struggle with anxiety and of course the the outpouring of love and um encouragement was so wonderful and to see that it meant so much to people um i had so many people email me and message me and say thank you i just thought you pastors were you know you had your lives rolling and everything was easy and great and wonderful and and david lane looked at me and said you're just like me and I looked at him and said, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I'm just like you. But you know, it's not an easy thing to admit when you struggle, is it? It's not an easy thing to admit when you fail and when you, when you mess up. And that's because we've got this pride thing that happens in us. But in order for us to repent, in order for us to have this sensitivity to sin, we've got to be a humble people. The man who is growing in grace will be willing to admit That he is in and of himself nothing. He will be willing to admit that in and of himself he has many, many weaknesses. He has to be willing to say as Job did, I am unworthy. To say as Abraham did, I am nothing but dust and ashes. 
To say as Jacob did, I am not worthy. To say as David did, I am a worm. Or as Isaiah did, I am a man of unclean lips. Or with Peter, I am a sinful man, O Lord. The Christian who is growing in grace, should there should be a greater sense of his weakness every single year. See, the person who's growing in grace has a better understanding of their own weaknesses. And that seems kind of counterproductive. You would think, no, no, wait. As you're growing in grace, you should see your strengths. No, as you're growing in grace, you see your weaknesses clear. You start becoming more sensitive to sin. Maybe you, maybe you notice things in your own life that you were able to easily look over in years past, but you can't simply look over them anymore. Now you realize these things need to get out of my life. The more that a Christian grows, the more he admits with Paul. I have not already attained. I am the least of all the saints. Or maybe the one that we're most familiar with. I am the chief of sinners. Now, I need to address something here. Because there is a, there, as soon as we say, I want to be humble. And I want to admit my weaknesses. Okay? That's a great place to be. The devil knows that's a great place to be. So you know what the devil's going to do? He's going to jump on you. And he's going to say, yeah, you are so weak. You'll never amount to anything. You are so weak. You'll never be able to do anything for the Lord. You are so pathetic. How's God ever going to use you? And so what happens is a proper attitude of humility. I am nothing. I am dust and ashes. I have nothing to offer. Which is exactly where we need to be as Christians. The devil wants to take that and plummet you into depression. I am nothing. I am weak. And God will never be able to use me. No, you see, the biblical position is to say, I am weak. I am nothing. I have nothing to offer. I do fail all the time. And my God's grace is sufficient for me. And he enables me. And he empowers me. So it's a proper view of yourself being sensitive to sin. Now, you know this practically. I hope that those of you who have been Christians for years, I hope that you do see things in your life quicker than you did when you first got saved. Now, there may have been some glaring sins in your life when you first got saved that you knew that you need to get rid of immediately. But there was probably a bunch of other stuff you kind of overlook a lot. But then as you begin to grow in Christ and grow in grace, what begins to happen is you begin to see those little things even. And you begin to hate those little things just like you do the big things. Right? Now, I've talked about this before and I think it's just worth repeating. And I am not... Well, let's just go down the cycle. It's easy for us to say homosexuality... Our homosexual marriage is a sin. It's easy for us to say. Because most of us in here don't struggle with wanting to be married to the same sex. But if let's just keep going. Well, guess what? Divorce is a sin too. Now we go, it's a little bit harder to home because I myself or somebody I love has been divorced. and, and, And that's harder. And then Jesus says, don't commit adultery either. Right. And then people, people might back off and go, well, yeah, I haven't committed adultery. And Jesus goes, but if you lust after someone, you've committed adultery in your heart. And what I'm talking about tonight is I'm talking about all of that troubling us. Us being sensitive to what we deal with, not just sensitive to what other people deal with. You know, I could get up and preach a marriage on homosexuality and I'm going to get tons of amens. I'm going to preach a message on lust and it's going to get real quiet real quick. And what we need to do is we need to grow in our sensitivity towards sin every single year. I'm weak. I'm nothing. I'm frail. Here's all the stuff that I'm willing to admit to God. I struggle with, I deal with, and I want out of my life. If you want to know if you are growing in grace, look to see if you are growing in your sensitivity to sin. 
Next. Our next mark is dominion over sin. Uh, We've done multiple series in here where you have heard me talk about the fact that we as Christians are supposed to be taking dominion over everything. My Sunday school class has gotten it even more. We as Christians have a mandate to take dominion over everything. Adam and Eve were given that command, were they not? Take dominion over the earth. Adam and Eve failed. Israel's given that same command. Israel fails. So then Jesus comes along and he does what Israel and Adam failed to do. He takes dominion over sin. You remember when when Jesus comes down off of the, the mount after being tempted? He begins preaching. The kingdom of God is at hand. And he begins healing people and forgiving sin. Immediately goes to work taking dominion. Casting demons out of people. Immediately... Jesus the man begins taking dominion over everything. We now as Christians have that same mandate to take dominion over everything. We have been set free spiritually. Amen? Amen. We have been set free spiritually. Now we are, we are in need of administering that freedom in every area of our lives. So God has freed us. Now we take that freedom and we administer that freedom into all the practical areas of our life. Especially taking dominion over sin. You, Christian, are free of sin. We have to administer that freedom in our lives. The person who is growing in grace gets dominion Over sin more and more every year. He is more watchful over his conduct. He notices his words. He notices his actions. And he tries to bring them in. In accordance to God's will. He is more. uh, More perceptive of his pursuit of being in Christ's likeness. If Christ came and took dominion, and I am supposed to be in the image of Christ, then what I'm supposed to be doing is taking dominion. In order to do that, then we have to be like Paul, where Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind, I press forward. Now, often when we we think about that verse... We often think, yes, I want to forget my failures that are behind me and pursue victory. But it's not just that. We even need to have a proper view of the victories we've had in the past and not be content with where we are now. Oh, I'm glad God's given me these victories. I've grown a lot and now I'm good. No, it's saying, listen, thank, thank you, Lord, for the victories in the past. I don't want to settle I have not yet arrived. There are things in my life that I need to continue to grow into. So I'm going to forget those things. Now, does Paul mean forget in the sense that we just act like they never existed? No. He's talking about mindset. Right? If my eyes are perpetually backwards... And that's all I'm doing is looking backwards at my victories or my, or my failures... Where are my eyes not looking? They're not looking forward to all that God is yet going to do. We've got to get our eyes looking forward. And we've got to say, thank you, Lord, that I don't struggle with this like I used to. But then apply that sensitivity to sin and say, but I still notice this in my life. And I want to get dominion over this as well. It's funny, I remember as a... um, This kind of combines them together, but these first two points. I remember going to kids camp at Red River Valley Bible Camp. And if you if you grew up at Calvary Hill back in the day, you went to Red River Valley Bible Camp. I think the last year we went is when literally everyone broke out with lice. And I think Brother James was like, all right, that we we might need to uh, (laughs) think of something else. I think Ben Jones started all that. Appreciate that. Um. I remember one of the counselors from another church, 
he was telling jokes, and they were Boudreau and Tipido jokes. They were jokes about Cajuns. And he's cracking these, of course, we were just rolling. We were laughing. They were funny. Of course, they're jokes that could apply to, you know, I mean, people talk about, you know, DeBlonde jokes or Aggie jokes or, you know what? Oh, my bad. My bad. Um, and he told those jokes and we laughed and we laughed and we laughed. And the next day, during break time, all the guys were back in the room and he walked in and he said, guys, can I, can I talk to all y'all? So all of us kids got back in there and he said, I, I think I need to apologize to you. And he said, I don't think what I did yesterday was appropriate in telling those jokes. And they, they weren't dirty. He said, because I could have very easily belittled some people. He said, I want to ask you to forgive me. And I remember thinking as a kid, what's he even asking for forgiveness for? But as I've gotten older, I've realized there was something that he was sensitive to. None of us kids were sensitive to. And I don't even know, I don't know to this day why he needed to ask for forgiveness. It wasn't for me. I wasn't offended. I didn't feel like he offended me. But there was something that he was sensitive to that wanted to, that he wanted to make sure he got dominion over this and he took care of it. And that's what we're talking about. Being sensitive to things that maybe are small things and making sure we have dominion over them. As C.S. Lewis writes, we must never be content, but we must always want to go further up and further in. I don't want to be content here, oh God, with maybe what you've done. I want to go further up. I want to go further in. I want you to take me places that I've never been before. I don't want to just be happy with what you've done in the past. I want you to take me forward. God has done a tremendous thing here at Calvary Hill Baptist Church. I praise God for it. My family has been here for almost 25 years. Um, this May or this March will be my dad's 25th year on staff. Uh, this May will be my 15th year being on staff. That's hard to believe. Oh, my back hurt. I just when I said that, my back started. I hurt my um, and I praise God. For the men and women that God has used up to this point in the ministry of Calvary Hill Baptist Church, I am a product of this ministry. If anybody ever says, well, oh, Calvary Hill, y'all need, y'all be great one day. You can at least point at me and say, well, that young man would, young man, that young man would say something different. He would say, we're already great. Amen. Look at what, look at what Calvary Hill did in his life. And, of course, we could all raise our hands, right, and say, look what Calvary Hill did in my life. Look what Calvary Hill did in my life. Now, I got news for us, guys. We, I, don't, I don't simply want us to go, well, man, God has done a great thing with Calvary Hill in the past. I want us to say, thank you, God, for what you've done in the past. But what do you have for us in the future? What are, what are you going to do for us in the future? That's a corporate thing. But that ought to be your attitude personally. If you want to know whether or not you're growing in grace, see if you're taking dominion over sin. Not just the big ones, the small ones too. Next mark of faith. Next mark of this is faith or trust in Christ. A person who is growing finds more in Christ to rest upon every single year. He rejoices in a different way all the time that Christ is, in fact, his Savior. Now, of course, we all put our faith in Christ when we were converted, right? So all of us, I mean, in order to be converted, we're saved by grace through faith. So in order to be converted, you must place your faith in Christ. But let's not think for one second that once we've placed our faith in Christ, there is not more trust that needs to come. We need to grow in that. We need to grow in our trust of the Lord. We need to, by faith, come to understand thousands and thousands and thousands of more things about our Jesus. I'm glad that I have learned, since I was 12 years old, more about Christ. Because you know what happens when you begin to know more about Christ, right? If you're a child of God, this is why it kills me when people say, we've had people literally in this church... No longer at our church. But people who have said to us, I think you need to be careful about reading too much. 
You need to be, you need to be careful about, about talking too much about doctrine. Listen, do you know why doctrine, you know why, why, um, Christology, the study of Christ is so important? Because the better my Christology is, the better I understand the attributes of Christ, who He is, His power, His might, His salvific work, the more I understand the doctrine of Christ, the better I am going to be at trusting Him and following Him. Amen. No one in this room would ever trust their life to a person that they do not know very well. Right? No, you're not going to go, you're not going to give yourself to somebody on the street and say, I'm going to place my life in your hands. That's not the way it works. How do you gain trust with human beings? Well, you get to know them, don't you? And the more you get to know them, the more trust you're willing to put in them. Isn't it a beautiful thing that what Christ does for us is he saves us with the simple truth of the gospel. I love you. I died for you. Repent and believe. Follow me. It's very simple. My son believed that when he was five years old. My daughter when she was four years old. It's so simple that a five-year and a four-year-old can comprehend and understand the gospel. And it's so deep that they'll never wrap their minds all the way around it. But as they process who Christ is, then guess what happens? They begin to trust him more and love him more and worship him more. And that's so important for us always to be growing. If you want to know if you're growing in grace, ask yourself, check and see, is, am I growing in my knowledge of Christ and am I growing in my trust of him in light of that knowledge? You know why you got to get doctrine right? Because if you don't get doctrine right, then you're not going to live right. Bad doctrine leads to bad living. Good doctrine leads to good living through the power of the Holy Spirit. Next is an interest in spiritual things. When, you, when, you, when the mark of a growing in grace, Christian is one that is interested in spiritual things. One of the great pleasure, pleasures of the gospel is that the more you know of it, the more you realize you don't know very much, and the more you want to know. Does that make sense? So you learn a little bit of it, and then you go, my goodness, I don't know anything like I thought I did. And that makes you want to know more. What's great about Christ, it's really a paradox, right? It's a paradox because you get Christ and you get satisfied and then you thirst like you've never thirsted before. So Jesus says, come to me, I'll give you living water. You'll never thirst again. So then we, we take in that living water and now there's a thirst that we've never had before and it's never going to be fully quenched because we're constantly going to be wanting more and more and more and more. The person who is growing has a constant increased desire to know more and more of spiritual things. He loves to talk about what he's learning as well. Remember what C.S. Lewis said? I know I've, I've said it in here before. We talk about, we worship, we praise that which we enjoy. It's natural. We don't even think about it. We just do it. I don't go to the top of a mountain in Colorado and have to process and think, now wait a minute. Okay, this is pretty. I ought to rejoice in this right now and enjoy it. Does that have to go through my mind? No, I get to the top of that mountain and I go, wow, look at how beautiful this is. I immediately, immediately begin praising the thing that I delight in. Immediately. Come up to me and start talking about my wife. I'm, just, I'm going to start praising who she is. Why? Because I delight in her. So it is with God. The, as our interest grows in spiritual things, then what's going to happen is a natural outflow of that is that we're going to have to talk about it. We're going to have to to talk about who he is and what he has done. It can't simply remain inside of us. Lewis would say if it remains inside of you, you're not delighting in it. You're not delighting in it.
It troubles me when people call themselves Christians and to get them to talk about the Lord is almost impossible. I mean, you almost have to pry it out of them. That means one of two things. Either they do not know the Lord or they are not growing in grace. And they're remaining these baby Christians because growth in grace produces an a increase in spiritual desire. An increase to know more and more. And then after you know more and more, guess what you want to do about it? You want to talk about it. You don't just want to keep it to yourself. You want everybody else to know how great this is as well. If you want to know if you're going in grace, look to see if your interest in spiritual things is growing. Listen, I understand not everybody is a quote unquote natural reader. Okay, I was at one time in my life not a natural reader. The Lord, through a series of events, moved in my life to make me a better reader. To where now, man, you give me, like, pick five things you can do. Reading's going to be up there. And I know that many of us in this room have a tough time reading. Let me just encourage you. Work at it. Make it a habit. Ask people what are good books from my level that I can start with and begin to try to read because what will happen is is the Lord will start using that to implant desires of of spiritual things and and you'll you'll read and you'll be like whoa 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 and all of a sudden you'll get excited about it and then you'll want to talk about it more and you'll want to read more and before you know it you're going to be reading books all the time because you want to know more and more and more all of a sudden Sunday morning is not just going to be enough for you Sun, of course, I'm saying that to people who are here on Sunday nights. Sunday nights is not going to be enough for you. Wednesday is not going to be enough for you. It's like, man, I got to get in the Word all the time. I got to be reading all the time. I, this can't just be something I do when we go to church. Next, a mark of one who is growing in grace is one who loves his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I could have spent time doing one of two things. I could have either just talked about the general process of of loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, but I think we know that in here already. So I want to talk about something that's more convicting. Great. Yes, you should love your brothers and sisters in Christ, but that includes those that are hard to love. You see, it is, it is easy for us to love those Christians that make it easy for us to love them. It is a completely different thing when God puts someone in your life who drives you nuts and you're still called to love them. Right? But what we want to do is we want to love those that make it easy on us. But Jesus didn't say, oh, just love those that make it easy. Do you think it was easy to Jesus to love on the 12 disciples? Good grief, those guys. I mean, I think about the night Jesus was arrested. This is the question that gets asked. Show us the Father. And 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 I and there's love in this, but I almost picture Jesus saying, "Are you kidding? If you've seen me, have, yeah, have you not been with me for these three years? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father." There had to have been times. Now Jesus was all knowing, so but there had to be times in his humanity that he just wanted to walk up to a rock and start banging his head up against it, like. You guys, I tell you the same thing over and over and over again. You know, and it's like, it's like, I guarantee the disciples were not easy men to love. But loving somebody is not about it being easy for you. Loving them is wanting them to be like Jesus. 
And so you love them and serve them, number one, to give you and to give them an example of what it looks like to love and serve, but to also push them toward Jesus. Real biblical love pushes people toward Jesus. And if you're if you have a relationship with somebody and, and I don't care what kind of relationship it is, if you have a relation, a human relationship and you are not attempting to push them toward Christ, you are not loving them. That's tough, isn't it? But that's what love does. Let's be honest. Everybody in this room has somebody at this church that when they start walking to you in the aisle or down the hallway, you go, oh, no. I mean, can we just, can we just, let's get real, okay? I mean, we all, we, we all, we all have somebody that we're like, this is going to be a hard conversation. This is going to be rough. Now, listen, guys. That, that is a reality of personalities. That's just the way it is. We grind on each other's nerves. But growing in grace is the willingness to love the people that it's not easy to love. So I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to simply approach this one and say, you can tell if you're growing in grace by the way you love people. I wanted to get even more specific. And I wanted us to say, you can tell you're growing in grace by how you're loving those that it's hard to love. So ask yourself, how am I doing at loving the people that it's really hard to love? And if you're not growing in that area, we probably got to take a little bit harder look at it, shouldn't we? You know, here's another fact to this. You know, we're commanded to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, that should be the end of it. We're like, well, why do I have to do? Well, Jesus commanded you to. So, I mean, there should be the end of it. But God gives us other things as well. Um, it's going to be a testimony to the lost world. The way we love on each other. It's going to be a testimony to the lost world. Um, and as I said last week, uh, Here's what we do. Yeah, there's a lot of people in my life that it's hard to love. And then somebody else says, there's a lot of people in my life it's hard to love. And you're probably in that group. (laughs) Right? Every one of us is in somebody's hard to love group. So what if we all just said, I'm not going to love those that are hard to love. Now nobody gets loved. Nobody gets loved. Because we're all in somebody's group. But the mark of the church is that they love in spite of that. They serve in spite of that. They give in spite of that. And the lost world sees that and says, wow, that's, that's not like my world. That's different. That's different. Another thing is this. Loving people, oh, I've said this before. Somebody has to love those that are hard to love. Right? Somebody's got to do it. Why, why shouldn't it be me? Who do I think I am that it shouldn't be me? Humility. Humility. So if you want to know if you're growing in grace, look to see if you're growing in love for those that are hard to love. Lastly, love for the lost. Missions at home and abroad should concern every Christian. Every single child of God should care about missions. It is not simply um, a filler on an envelope. It is a fulfillment of the Great Commission. It is a fulfillment of our calling to take the glory of God to every nation. Missions, home and abroad... 
You say, what's home missions? Your neighbors, your family, your friends, your neighborhood, your community. By the way, you know that missionaries from China are being sent to America to do missionary work? You know how many young people upstairs in refuge I have talked to that have said they have never heard the gospel? I'll lay out the gospel. I said, have you ever heard anything like this before? You would be shocked at how many kids look at me and say, no. See, we like to think that, well, no, we're a Christian. We're Americans. Wrong, guys. That has never been the case. I don't want you to think that was ever the case. It's not like 100 years ago that was. No, it's never been the case. There's always been lost people in this country who needed the gospel. And God calls you to do it. But God also calls you to care about foreign missions. That doesn't mean that you've been called to be a missionary. I tell Jessica, after every mission trip I've ever gone on, I've come home and said to her, it, I love it, I enjoy it, my heart wants to minister to those people and those pastors, but I am called to local church ministry and there's no doubt about it. So I'm not called to foreign missions to be a missionary, but I am still called to foreign missions, right? I am called to give my money, to give my time. I, I'm, I'm thankful that we take a trip every January and go with the young adults to Mexico. I'm thankful that we're, we've served alongside SCR now for how many, how many years? 15 years we've been serving alongside SCR in, in our mission to Mexico. I'm glad that this church is the biggest sponsor of Melissa Wells over in the Czech Republic. I'm glad that we give to the cooperative program where money comes from all over churches to support Southern Baptist missionaries. I want to be a part of that in my prayers. Let me just read you this. Say, well, how can I be a part of missions? Pray. You've got to be the first thing that we do. Pray. Preach. You say, whoa, 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 preach? It doesn't necessarily mean be preachy. But you're called to teach people the gospel. Not just the pastors here at this church. You are. In fact, our job as pastors is to equip you to do it. That's our number one job, is to equip the church to do the work of the ministry. That's what Paul told Timothy. Now, we are to be evangelistic ourselves. But a church that sits back and lets the pastors do all the evangelism is a dying church. It is just a matter of time for that church is done for. Visit. Give money. As Brother James said today, according to your prosperity. And I would say this. Be a part of, of missions at home and abroad according to your calling. You say, well, I'm, I'm, I would never be good at debating somebody. Then don't debate. You don't have to debate people. Share the gospel. And they start throwing a bunch of questions at them. Look at them and say, I don't have the answers to all that. But what I do have, I can tell you. Share the gospel. If you are decreasing in your concern for the souls of others, then you can bet that your spirituality is decreasing. If you don't care about the souls of others, there's no way you're growing in grace. So if you want to know if you're growing in grace, look to see if you're growing in your love for the lost. Now, this is obviously not an exhaustive list. I have not gone through everything, but I went through six pretty good ones. I mean, these are some pretty good ones. I think if you take these six and you started wanting to be really good at these six and grow in these six, it's amazing. So these are some big ones. So let us examine ourselves carefully. Let us consider our growth. We will never be a master of any of them. 
until Christ re- returns. The question is not, am I a master of them? The question is, am I growing? Am I growing? And are there marks in my life that people can see, that I can see?